So, Julie, welcome to the Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Ed. Very good indeed. Thank you. Good. And, and how is your world today? Is it bright and sunny where you are? or The sun is shining. I think the birds have been seen this morning. I've got a cup of coffee. It's Friday. So, you know, I've got a good weekend ahead and life's good. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, hopefully you're ready for my first question then, which is uh, your, your first job. I always like to find out people's first job. Um, so, yeah. What was your first job after education? Um, my first job after education was actually to, to go straight into franchising, although I didn't realise at the time that that's what I was doing. Um, but I graduated, didn't know what to do, applied for what I thought was a short term three month contract in kind of semi sales marketing role um, and ended up that the, the I was actually working for a franchisee but the franchisee was part of the a franchise that was owned by uh, the Pront Print Group. Okay. So that led me to then, after the three-month contract was finished, I obviously can't have been too bad, and um, it led me to then to go to work for the franchisor. And then basically I ended up um, running their training outlet I ended up training new franchisees. That took me on to support, traveling around the country, working with franchisees to get the businesses up and running established, and then providing them with longer term ongoing support after that. Um, and during the time, the, the group floated on the, the USM. So it had a listing of about 10.6 million and floated on the USM. And I think it was the first franchise or group of companies that ever did that so it was a really really you know like just good interesting absolutely fabulous learning time and learning opportunity and I spent five and a half years six years with them just literally learning and soaking up all of this stuff because franchising was like very new at the time in terms of um said the SME sector in the, in the UK basically um, and that's really how I came into franchising and uh, I've never left. Wow. So, yeah, straight straight off the bat then, really. And um, what was your kind of day-to-day -day task when you started out with that company? Um, initially, day-to-day, -day, so working with the franchisee, it was business development, marketing, promotion. And, and literally on the first day, uh, the lady who was actually the MD at the time was a lady called Sue Rostad, who set up this, this business, which was called Poppies. And uh, she was very into media and PR, and she was very much the face of the, the company. And on the first day, she rang me to see how it was going. And I said, it's going really well. I said, I've got an interview this afternoon with the local radio station, because we'd done this competition about a Christmas raffle prize, and we were looking for a charity. And we kind of come up with the idea and, and that rang this radio station. They said, oh, come along and chat about it. And she nearly fell off a chair in terms of like day one and and she was the you know the media face of the company and I think I think that probably set the tone of our working relationship for the next five and a half years because the majority of the people that worked in the company she could be a bit challenging is probably the best way to describe basically but I just always got on with her and and probably to some great degree challenged her back basically and it uh, <laughs> It was a really good working relationship. So, yeah, that, that was day one. And then... How, how old were you on day one, by the way? 21. 21, yeah. So it's still still quite young. And, and to, to have bold ideas like that and start to implement them on your first day, you know? Well, I think, you know, the, the kind of the advantage of youth is that you are, to some degree, ignorant of, you know, what the limitations <laughs> are. And, uh, and I just thought, let's just try this and see what happens and see where it goes and... It went really well. Um, and then I ended up, you know, within a year um, running, the, the company had the a new training outlet in Newcastle. And I ended up, uh, I was sent up there to, to do a particular task, which actually ended up in the manager, unfortunately, leaving because the thing wasn't being run particularly well. Um, so I ended up managing it like a year later at 22. Um, and there were something like, 300 members of staff who were all part-time cleaners and then uh, full office staff so that was a bit of a baptism of fire in terms of trying to manage a business which needed 
quite a lot of reworking basically with these 300 members of staff all of whom were probably like literally twice my age um uh, but but yeah we just got like stuck in and you know got the team together and you know worked at it and made it happen basically um and then it ended up being the training outlet so then I was training the new franchisees and again I was like 22 23 training these people who were literally probably again twice my age and I can remember one day this guy said to me doesn't it bother you training people who are significantly older than you? <laughs> and I said, you know, I've never thought about it. I said, I just thought, this is, this is what I do. You need to know this. So it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm quite happy about it. It's never, never given me any issue, basically. But obviously, that was interesting because that was his perception, basically, in terms of, you know, probably, I think when I was 22, I actually looked about 15 because I was quite... <laughs> kind of skinny and scrawny and you know so so probably I looked even younger than I was basically but again just just got on with it and did it sure and and what was um what what was it like working for the the franchisee I mean did you were you aware that they'd invested money into a, a business into a franchise or was that just not even part of the conversation I guess to be honest it wasn't the the investment that didn't really phase me it was the fact the business wasn't doing well and there was one reason why the business wasn't doing well and that was the franchisee she basically wasn't doing anything she was just you know, sitting behind the desk all day and not you know doing anything in terms of engaging with new potential new clients work with the staff or anything the business was just completely and utterly flat um my background is is a family business so you know my family had had a couple of businesses and I'd been brought up in family business environment and literally from age five you know was um, was part of the team basically so Christmas time we sold wrapping paper and we all folded Christmas wrapping paper for weeks on end um, so for me there was a direct connection between hard work and success and that just wasn't there it just wasn't happening I said the whole atmosphere was just flat so it wasn't difficult to actually make some change that you know made some improvement because it was at such a base level. So I spent three months and you know I kind of did what I could do in that three month period. It certainly wasn't something that that I would have stayed around long term because at the end of the day the problem was the person at the top who was running the business. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting though because it's probably it probably was a good start for you in in a way because you could see how not to do it so when you went into your role of in training okay look i've seen what can happen if you don't get this right so yeah it i guess it holds it helps you to hold a bit of gravitas in that situation right because you've seen yeah yeah my advice to the franchisees that i was training is listen you've got to love your business and you've got to be the life and soul and the buzz of the business because if you don't love the business and if you don't, you know, if, if you don't make it buzz, no one else will. So, you know, you've got to love it. You've got to believe it. You've got to be passionate about it. And then that, that love, that passion, that enthusiasm, that commitment will, will pass on to the people around you because it's, because it's infectious. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So um, mo moving on in your career, then what, what was next for you? Um, I left the, the Prontement Group so about five and a half, six years, and I actually went into the telecommunications sector. Um, and basically, Prontement was based in Darlington. There was a small company based in Darlington that, that was very new and, and growing in the, the telecom sector because the telecoms market had reasonably recently been liberalised. Um, and the, the guys who owned the business wanted to franchise, but they knew nothing about it. Um, one of the director's wives actually worked for Prunt Print. She was the, we had like receptionist at the time and they approached me and said, would I be interested in going to work for them? And I thought, yeah, I'll give that a go. So um, <clears throat> I basically took all of the knowledge and experience that I'd gained in the five and a half years um, and went into to their business and set things up from scratch, created all the documentation, all the, bro the brochures, the systems, the procedures, worked with the solicitors to get the agreements, et cetera. And then started the, you know, we launched the franchise 
And in the time that I was with them, which was about another five and a half years, the business grew from three outlets to about 35, 36. Um, the investment level then was quite significant. It was, by the time I left, the investment level was 80 to 100K. So it was you know, quite significant and people yeah. were joining who'd been made redundant, who had packages, you know, were investing life savings. Um, and I left on a Monday afternoon at quarter past one because I didn't believe in that what I was doing at that time anymore was the right thing to do. So I couldn't continue to do it because I didn't believe that commercially the business was going in the right direction and I couldn't continue to bring those people into the business to commit that, you know, that significant amount of money. Um, so I left. Okay. And, and um, what, what happens after that point? Well, I'd known for a time really that the, you know, the writing was on the wall. Um, we'd taken an investor into the business and and I'd basically there was a, a the structure of the business was there, there was a chairman and there were two MDs. I was the MD of the like franchise side of the business. And there was an MD of the like telecoms commercial side of the business. And some of the things that we were doing, which was predominantly going into retail sites of very high rentals. Um, I didn't believe was the right thing to do. We were we were actually ahead of the market. So I'd spoken to the investor and said to the investor's representative, Look, I'm, I am concerned about this, and, and they weren't overly interested in doing anything about it. And I'd spoken to the chairman and said, Look, I am concerned about it. And and again, he you know decided that um didn't want to do anything about it either. So it just came to a point. I'd tendered my resignation twice. And, and it was refused. And then on the third time, it was a question of, you know, okay, if that's how you feel, then, you know, that's it. And so it literally was, you know, walk out past one on a Monday afternoon. But because I'd known for a while what was happening, I'd, for want a better term, had a couple of lifeboats, as it were, you know, set up alongside. And I'd been introduced to a company in London who wanted to franchise and, I'd already like had some discussions with them. I knew that they wanted, you know, some support. So I walked out of the job and into then the world of self-employment because I decided then I didn't want to go and work for anyone else again, although I was actually director and shareholder of the previous company. I didn't want to go and work for anyone again in that kind of capacity. I wanted much more control of my own life, destiny, et cetera. So I did a, a six month contract and was in effect a freelance. And then I was working in London and kept thinking, you know, there's, there must be lots of businesses at the time in the north of England, because that's where I'm from, as you may know by my accent, um, who have got the potential to grow and develop through franchising. Um, and so the, the franchise company, which, which is my business and, and is still my business, came about through that real kind of desire to help companies in the north of England expand and develop and grow through franchising because at the time there were you know, consultancies in London and franchise consultancies in yeah. Birmingham, but nothing in the north. So that was the idea and that's how the franchise company came to be established. Excellent. So I'm going to ask you some questions about that in a, in a moment, but I just want to go back to that, that point where you, you, you mentioned you wanted to take back control of your life. I think that's something that a lot of us feel at, at various points in your career, right? And it's when you start to disagree with the strategy of the organization. Um, I've spoken to quite a few people and that's, that's typically what happens, right? Is at some point you're working on a project you don't believe in, or you don't agree, you know, with the, the direction the company's going and people have this real realization, don't they, that actually needs to do something about it. But I, I think it's, um, disappointing that for a lot of people they they don't then take that leap into owning a business or or doing something about it they they tend to end up going to another company where they hope that their their the strategies are aligned until they're not one day and, and then move on again don't they and and i i guess it'd be interesting to find out from you why what why kind of take that leap what because obviously there's a risk everyone's sort of worried about the risk of going it alone what kind of helped you to to go, do you know what? I'm just doing it. 
I think, to be honest, Ed, it was because, as I said earlier, you know, I come from a family that that had a small business background. So running a business wasn't, you know, wasn't in any way, shape or form foreign, unusual, frightening, scary. Um, and so it just felt natural for me to do that. And I'd got to the stage I'd worked for, you know, two, well, one like really big, really big kind of franchise or organization, another one that was small and growing and developing and had a you know, huge amount of potential, but that potential wasn't um, wasn't achieved at the end, basically. And so, yeah, I could have gone to work for someone else, but that just didn't appeal to me, basically. So the, the self-employment, setting up in business, risk-taking, yes, there was, you know, an element of risk, but again, I mean, I was, you know, I was still, like, relatively young. I didn't have any direct responsibilities, okay? I had my own house, but my mortgage wasn't huge, basically. So, so yeah, there was a risk, but it was a contained risk. And, and the reality was that if it hadn't have worked out, then, you know, I could have always gone back to, to work for someone else, you know, at any time in the future, basically. Um, sure. So, yeah, it just felt, it felt like the right thing to do for me to take that control. And I did have this real, you know, passion, desire, belief, vision about, you know, setting something up that would help say businesses in my region um to grow and develop and um and again that's what we wanted to do so this was back in 91 is that right oh, yeah yeah that's right 1991 so it was literally like you know pre pre lots of uh like the internet sort of all that communication it was very much traditional business development and i had i actually had a guy who worked with me he was very experienced in on the business development side he, he'd come from um, like yellow pages so his background was you know very much kind of business to business sales and literally he did you know he did the business development side so my skills were used on the actual project delivery side as well so our mix of skills and experience worked very well basically the things that I either wasn't very good at doing or didn't like doing or didn't want to do he was quite good at doing and, and very good at you know doing the, the business development side as well yeah, that's interesting because you, you said you started out in your career in, in sales and marketing type role and, and obviously had some some success in um, a, a bit of PR work, I guess, or, you know, finding a PR opportunities, but actually it's transitioned more into um, kind of looking at the processes and, and, and legal documentation, those kinds of things, the setup, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of business development, I'm quite comfortable talking you know, to anyone and everyone about franchising, because that's what I've done for the last God knows how many years. <laughs> so, and, you know, obviously the business development tools that we use now have moved on significantly. So we get, you know, we get inquiries that come to us and that, that's in a lovely, um, or we get business and work referred, that's a lovely position to be in. But literally at the time, it was, you know, picking up the telephone, looking at companies, identifying companies that may have the potential to, to franchise, and then getting on the phone and ringing them. Um, and that really wasn't my, you know, my bag, my area of expertise, basically. That's what that's what he did. So yeah. I was more marketing, he's more of the, you know, the sales side. Okay, that's fair enough. It's um it's important to have that kind of support, isn't it? Because I don't think anybody when they start out necessarily have all the skills to do absolutely everything, right? I I think maybe there's a few special people out there, of course, but um that support from other people or a network around you. And, and I guess you had it in a way with um, a family of, of, of entrepreneurs, right. As well as, as a backup um, who could give you advice. That's, that's something that's really important. I think for any, any person starting a business, whether it's franchised or otherwise, right. Yeah. I think it's very, it's very important that you actually are careful about who you take the advice from because you know, my my background, my my parents had run you know, retail outlets. So, you know, with respect to what I was doing in terms of the actual kind of franchising process, etc., wasn't really anything that they were aware of. But, you know, my father was a, a very small business entrepreneur, so would have been very supportive in terms of, you know, give it a go and see what happens, basically. Um, my brother was an accountant, so again, I could bounce things off him. But to be honest, he was a, a large corporate accountant. He was okay. he worked with Arthur Anderson. So he really actually didn't really understand the small business world because what they did with the corporates was, was very far removed. Um, 
And my experience has been, you know, particularly with, with working with potential franchisees, actually do be very careful about who you talk to, obviously not in terms of your professional advisors, but even then make sure your professional advisors understand the SME market and, and specifically understand franchising. You know, but all too often we hear the story about, oh, I was talking to my neighbour, I was talking to my friend, or talking to the guy in the pub, and, you know, they, they've seen all this stuff about franchising on the news and watchdog and whatever. Um, and it's just really be, you know, be careful and be aware of the person that you're talking to and, and what really their knowledge and information base is, basically, and, and whether they're actually in a position to give you good, solid advice or not. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and I guess try and speak to more than one person because everybody's got a, a different point of view, right, and a different angle to, to look at things. And, um, yeah, that, speaking to multiple people, I've done it myself and realised actually somebody's always got something else to bring to the table that I perhaps hadn't thought about. So, yeah, yeah get, get that rounded view, I guess, is, is what you're saying there, rather than, yeah, yeah the guy down the pub. <laughs> And speak to lots of people and at the end of the day, you know, take a balanced view and do the thing that's right for you. Um, because, you know, when you go into business, it is going to be down to the decisions that you make that will determine, you know, the, the potential success of the business or otherwise. So certainly in terms of a business, as a business owner and a business operator, um, I'm very much of the view that yeah, you know, we very, you know, we take advice, we talk it through, we discuss it, um, and we take advice from professional advisors, accountants, solicitors, whatever. But actually, at the end of the day, it's about doing what what we think is right for the business. And 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 as the business owner, you know, you're the one that's directly there. So sometimes, with respect to the professional advisors particularly our friends, the, the legal eagles, there may be things that, you know, they might be cautious about yeah. or, you know, slightly advise against, but actually given the, the much better position of information that, that we might be in, we might, you know, do it because we believe that's the right thing to do from the business's point of view. So, yes, I do think it's about taking advice and listening to lots of people, but at the end of the day, making the decision that, that is right for you and feels right for you as well. Perfect. So your business, the, the franchise company then, um, early days, what sort of businesses were you looking to, to support moving into that, that franchising model then? Because, um, yeah, that, I mean, were you looking at the, the food and beverage, which, you know, a lot of people see as franchising um, from the outside and, until they kind of, dig under the surface a little bit so was it f &B yeah. companies or well yeah there were there were a few few kind of f &B companies that, that we worked with um and then i was introduced to a guy called john marshall who ran a business called durham pine and they'd been on the bbc with some bbc business development winning workshop concepts um so I actually developed the franchise model for Durham Pine and that grew from 10 shops initially to over 100 basically. Um, so that was a really, you know, kind of good project, good client to, to work with. Then there was another, another company who, who, funny enough, were based very locally called Ramsdens and they uh, were a firm of pawnbrokers. Okay. And the guy, the guy who'd set it up... Um, was a jeweler by by trade and again to cut a long story short worked with him and them to develop their franchise model um and ultimately they ended up being bought out twice and have actually now floated on the stock market for a huge amount of money basically <laughs> so even you know even though the work that we did like 20 odd years ago will no longer be seen around in, in its format as, as it was then. It was part of their growth and development. Um, and again, that was just you know, indicative of the very broad range and types of, of businesses um, that we worked with. And, and another project that I worked on at the time, early days, was with a lady called Shai Garland, who set up Garland call centres. And she ended up winning the Verve Clio Woman of the the year award um and i got i got asked to go in and speak to her from the department of trade and industry because she'd actually had 
a number of other consultants who she'd spoken to and none of whom fit her bill, basically. So I got, got asked to go in. And she actually, she gave me my very first franchise development project um, because I obviously said things that, that made sense to her, basically. And we didn't, you know, didn't talk loads of jargon, just talked hopefully lots of commercial common sense and it all stacked up and made sense. And uh, yeah, she was my first client. So debt collection, call centres, pine retailing, food retailing, garage door installations, um, just an example of the, you know, the first clutch of clients that we worked with. Yeah, so varied, isn't it? And so so different to what I think people from from outside the franchising world think of when they they think of a, a company that can be franchised. So, with, with that, do you think there's any brands that couldn't be franchised, or any types of businesses? Sorry, not brands, but businesses. Um, the businesses that potentially can't be franchised are quite often the businesses that are in the manufacturing sector who don't have the the kind I mean things have changed now in terms of manufacturers being much closer to the end user anyway but traditionally a manufacturer you know was very distinct and separate to the the retail sector because they were traditionally sold through through wholesalers so manufacturers were never you know our target market basically is uh, is probably the best to, way to describe them but I don't think it's really about so much about the sectors i think it's actually more about the business and predominantly the, the individuals who you know own the business and really whether they have the business might be suited to franchising but it may be that the individuals who who own the business are not um and so one of the you know, the criteria when we're working with, uh, with, with companies is to actually enable the, the business to understand what the franchising process is, how it works, what's involved, what the commitment is, et cetera, and really to help them decide whether it's the right route for them strategically or not, and whether it suits them as individuals as well as suiting the business as a business model, basically. Yeah, sure. So what, why, I guess there's not one reason, but why do people typically want to franchise their business? It, there's, the, the common reasons are they've grown the business to a stage where, in effect, it's, you know, used all of the capital that they've got, they've got or, or that they can access or they want to, you know, to borrow um, capital and, in effect, the use of you know, capital from franchisees who invest in the businesses is, is a prime driver. In the case of um, Durham Pine, John Marshall, he he got to a stage where he'd grown the business to about 10 shops and, and all of the shops were within an hour's drive time. And he said, you know, if I can get to a shop within an hour, I'm comfortable and it means if anything happens, get down there to, you know, to sort it out but geographically didn't want to go any further than that. So his, his reason wasn't to do with uh, finance or capital. It was to do with bringing people into the business who would take over the day-to-day -day responsibility of running the business. Um, and that was very much, you know, why he, why he chose to, to go down the franchising route. And then, you know, the third reason is, is very much to, to bring the people in with the, the ownership at local level who really have, again, the passion and the drive to deliver the business um, branding, values, customer service levels at the, the highest possible level that you know, can be achieved by franchising because the franchisees are committed, dedicated, focused and have invested into the business. And, and for the, these businesses that are looking to franchise, I I guess they're investing a significant amount to put the structure in place. Is that right? Or, or, or is it fairly easy for them to do? Well, I mean, again, depending on who you talk to, you'll, you'll hear a range of different levels. Our, our, our experience in terms of investment is to, to go through the franchising process and get the, the legals in place. Um, you're looking at generally in the region of kind of 20 to 25,000 pounds. Okay. Um, and then you've got to get some, you know, marketing budget to, or some recruitment activity to actually get the thing up and running. But, you know, I've heard of people who spent 
£25,000 on getting their legal agreements um, in place. And I've heard of people who've spent a lot more than £25,000 on going through the development process. So, you know, it is varied. And, and again, like anything in life, as a business owner, if you are potentially thinking of franchising, then you certainly need to talk to a number of people and um, make sure that the, the fit is right yeah. you know, from all levels. Obviously, there's the capital investment, but also there's the, the skills and, and very much the chemistry, because a lot of what we do, we've got to do all of the like the functional bits in terms of understanding the business model and reanalyzing it, how it will operate on a franchise basis, um, and then putting in the documentation that's required, et cetera. But a lot of it is actually, you know, working very closely with the, the management team and, and sometimes um, being a bit challenging in terms of what they do and why they do it and how they do it, or maybe challenging their views in terms of, how they think the business model should be restructured on a franchise basis. Um, and you can only do that if you've got the right working relationship and the chemistry is right. Yeah, sure. So you, you mentioned um, the, the, re the recruitment piece there. That's obviously an important part for these franchisors going out there and finding people that, that want to buy into their, their brand or, or have the same passions as they do. Um, if, so I'm going to flip it slightly. So if I'm a, a potential franchisee and um, I'm looking for where the good brands are, um, you know, wh where where do these franchisors advertise? Where 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 are they kind of looking for people? Um, there's a range of you know activities that franchisors do. There's the franchise exhibitions, which are now coming back. I mean, next week there are two franchise exhibitions: one in London at the Excel Arena and one in Birmingham at the NEC. And excuse me, franchise exhibitions are always a really good initial source of information and contacts. And you know, just if you if you, know, if you if you know nothing about franchising, go to a franchise exhibition and walk around and talk to people and learn and listen and go to seminars. You know, and start to gain that knowledge and information. And again, as an exhibitor, you do see sometimes the same people coming back two or three times, maybe over two or three years because they're going through that knowledge acquisition process, potentially sometimes in anticipation of you know, retirement or redundancy, or just they know that when they get to a certain age, they want to do something different. So there's the exhibitions, there's the portals, there's a lot of you know, franchise portals out there. Um, if you Google franchising or a particular sector that you're interested in, then you, know, you will come up with various um, portals that will give you lots of advice. There's the Franchise Associations, there's the British Franchise Association, the Quality Franchise Association that, you know, has got lots of advice. And, and both of those do seminars for potential franchisees. So you know, we're involved with the British Franchise Association in seminars for franchisors, and they do the same thing for franchisees as well. So there are, you know, lots of ways, particularly now, where you can literally sit at your desk or get on your phone and find out lots of information but at the end of it that's all about the initial kind of knowledge acquisition process at the end of it you then have to start to fine tune the process in terms of thinking you know a bit more clearly about the kind of business that you actually want to be involved in and from my point of view that's a bit similar to the process of buying a house in terms of you would know possibly the type of house you wanted to buy, the size of the house, the area you want to be in, the price that you're looking to pay, you know, etc. So you've got a list of criteria when you go house hunting. You don't just go randomly looking for any kind of house. And that's really the same when, when you're looking for a franchise. You know, you should have some form of criteria in terms of do you want to be in retail or do you not want to be in retail? Do you want to be in a business where you employ people or you don't want to have a business that's employ people? We, we have quite a lot of clients who run what we call man in the van operations and some of their franchisees come from you know, quite kind of senior management roles and they'll come into the business, whatever activity it is, because they've 
you know, they've had their time managing teams of people and they actually just want something that's entirely within their direct control. So they might have a career doing whatever and then they're, you know, happily doing whatever it is, driving around, visiting the customers, you know, band-based operation, basically, because um, that works for them at their stage in their, their career, basically. So I think it's important to, to at least have that understanding of the kind of business that you're looking for when you do start to look seriously. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a really good point about the, 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 the man in the van kind of franchises because um, maybe you just want to get f away from all the responsibility that's on your shoulders. Like, um, you know, some of these people are managing huge teams and that uh, are responsible for their, their, their lives, you know, and their incomes. And um, yeah, it can be too stressful and you don't get all the, the hours that you want for family and, and things like this. And, and actually deciding when you, you book in to go and mow someone's lawn or whatever it is, you know, um, could be quite appealing. So yeah, that, that make, makes a lot of sense. And, um, having the, the criteria in place, I think that also makes a lot of sense as well. I think, um, I think you kind of need to sit down and, and have that kind of conversation with yourself in a way, you know, and say, this is what I, enjoy doing this is what i'm good at this is the budget that i want to spend this is what i'm prepared for over the next year or two while i set up the business and yeah and, and see what matches up to that really yeah i mean like everything in life there, there are occasions when you meet something that doesn't meet your criteria but ultimately is the right thing for you and and that's you know you can start off looking for a house in a certain area and end up buying something entirely different because you just walked in and fell in love with it basically and there are a few companies that we've worked with that are so almost different and unique that you wouldn't have, you know, no, one was, no one was going to be looking for the business. So, so as an example, um, a lady called Elaine Everett, I worked with for a long time and she sort of set up a business called Motivation & Co. And Motivation & Co went into nursing homes and delivered classes for the, the residents to um, maintain physical and mental dexterity. Now, it was very unusual, very unique. It wasn't, no one was looking for a franchise in that sector. So, so the engagement, sometimes at exhibitions, was very much a, almost a, a surprise and a shock. And when the understanding came, that's what the business did. You could see people almost falling in love with it straight away because it, it appealed to lots of things that they, they did or they were looking for. So they might have been looking for something in care and came across that kind of business. Um, so there are exceptions to the rule, but you know, generally it still met, they were looking for something in an aligned field, but didn't know that that existed until they actually saw it basically. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I think you've got to come into it with a, yeah, with that criteria, but with an open mind ultimately, because you don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> and there might be a, a better, better solution than what you think. So. Yeah, perhaps not kind of go straight in and say, right, I'm only looking at this type of business and that's it. Just, yeah, have a yeah, fairly open I mean, mind. And again, with that specific example, there are a lot of people who actually ended up being franchisees who came to the business because they'd had family members that had experienced, you know, kind of situations, um, potentially living in residential care, you know, needing more support, stimulation, whatever. So being part of the journey that enabled that service to be delivered into lots and lots and lots of residential homes across the country, you know, was very was a very powerful motivator from their point of view and mine as well, in all honesty. Sure, definitely. So um, what, what do you think a good franchisor looks like? I mean, you, you've you've worked with um, plenty now over the years and, and helped them to to build their their businesses. So, what do you think a, a good franchise or looks like, and and how does a person try and find that out? Because you know each of them seems to have different processes, different marketing materials. It's difficult to kind of know and compare them all, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think a good franchise or you know, first of all, they have to have developed obviously a really good strong business model. So a good franchisor has taken the time and effort to actually invest in their business and put the systems and procedures in place within their business to enable the business to grow and develop and 
you know, that's all about not building a house on sand, isn't it? Yeah. And and now things have shifted in terms of the old analogy of a business in a box was when you, you know, you put everything into the box and you gave the box to the franchisee and the franchisee opened the box in their location and replicated the systems that the franchisor had created. Now the franchisor, you know, holds most of those systems centrally. So again, it's all about having good central systems, whether it's for marketing, you know, accountancy, whatever, basically. So it's having that, that, that core business. It's being a responsible business owner and being someone who probably has good standing within the industry. So they've got good networks within the industry. They're hopefully perceived as being, if not an industry leader, someone again who's respected within the industry because if they're not respected within their own industry, then that's probably potentially a good sign that they may not be the type of people that you want to be involved with either, basically. So respect from within their industry, knowledge within their industry. Um, and someone who can think strategically. So they're looking at the medium and long-term activities of where the market's going, what it's doing, where, where it's likely to go. Um, and then in terms of the interpersonal communication skills, you know, they, they've either got or they've got the team in place to deliver all of the things that the franchisee needs in terms of training and support and business development. Um, and ultimately, at the end of it, I think an individual that, that you, as a potential franchisee, feel comfortable with and, and have respect for, because in life and in business, you know, we don't always need to be best friends when we're working with someone, but we do need, my view is we need to have mutual respect for each other. Um, and again, going right back to, you know, my own story in terms of, you know, one of the reasons that I left the, the company that I was with is that I lost the respect for the individuals that I was working with. Um, and so I, I just knew I couldn't continue working in that environment. So I, for me, mutual respect both ways is, is a very important part of any business relationship. Yeah, I agree completely. And I get the feeling from speaking with you that, um, you know, I'd know where I stood at all points in the, in a conversation with you and, 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 and relationship, but in a, a, you know, in a healthy way, you know, it's, um, uh, you, you appear to have some really good standards about ethically what what um, the businesses should look like, and um, yeah, I, I respect that. You know, it's it's something that um, not everybody has, and it can be quite difficult to to find people that have that. So um, yeah, it sounds like you're doing a good job with these franchisors and giving them advice. And I think that comes from kind of the morals that you've displayed already in your your kind of earlier career, which is which is great. But um, I have a, I have a few more questions that I wanted to 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 ask you, and actually I've got loads more questions, but I know we've we've only got about ten minutes left or so. So, um, the first one I wanted to ask you is what what's been the most surprising um, business that you've seen or helped to franchise? What's been the most surprising type of business? Um, probably the most surprising and you know to some degree eye opening business from my point of view was actually the Ramsden's pawnbroking business yeah because it was you know in all honesty it was an area of life that I'd never ever been exposed to and and I think it's an area that you know we all have our own perception of but actually you know once I got involved and started to work with them I realized that it's heavily regulated by the Financial Services Authority. The guy who was running, you know, the business at the time that I was working with, who was the owner, again, he was very, you know, ethical. He was very straight. He was very honest. He had good systems in place. He had good people that, that worked with him. And it was really, just for me, completely and utterly eye-opening in terms of another area of life that, that I'd just never, ever envisaged. And... You know, I am a lady who likes diamonds, and I have to say, as part, <laughs> as part of the working relationship, um, the the kind of banter was always he would call me, and because the, the business was located very close to our office, 
and uh, say pop around for a coffee and I'd go around and he would show me like these massive diamond rings that people had just brought <laughs> in and pledged you know for for a few thousand pounds or whatever basically so I, it was just literally it was eye-opening and um yeah, it was, it was very different. And then to see that go on and grow and develop, and I say ultimately, you know, bringing people in who did very well in the business from the, the franchisee's perspective, um, and then see it ultimately float on the stock market was uh, was really gratifying. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? And it, I, I mean, until you mentioned it today, I didn't realise that could be a business that could be franchised, you know, but I guess when you sort of, sit down and think about it and dig dig into the kind of what what actually is the business system behind it it yeah it probably makes a lot of sense doesn't it it, do, it doesn't matter what the face of it what it is it's just the systems behind if they're replicable yeah and ultimately it's the model that the likes of cash converters use to yeah. actually they they just took a different commodity so instead of Traditionally, pawnbrokers use jewellery and, you know, various other things, and, and the cash converters just use modern day-to-day -day household items, basically. So it's the same model, but just using, you know, different, um, different items of value. Sure, yeah. Excellent. So um, next thing I wanted to ask you is uh, if you've had any funny, strange, or, or weird stories from your, from your career, you're happy to share with us. <laughs> Um, well, I think, as you, as you know from various discussions that we've had, Ed, as part of my journey in franchising, I've also done a lot of work in the social enterprise sector and, and charity sector. Um, and that's led me to, you know, literally ending up in some amazing places. Um, and I can remember literally sitting on a plane flying out to Uganda and the project was to talk about sustainability in the, the healthcare sector in Uganda. And I can literally remember sitting on this plane thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is just so far away from where I started. You know, what am I doing here? But actually, when we, when we got there and I understood what the project was and what the, you know, the challenges were, it almost the solution was a very simple master franchise model that we would use for international development. So after about six days of literally listening and learning and absorbing and trying to get my head around something, um, I kind of stood up in the boardroom with the, the management team and put this very simplistic diagram with, you know, most franchise or um, international franchisee, unit franchisees boxes and said to the, you know, the team, so explained what it was and how does that how does that look to you and the guy who was the uh the md just looked at me and went yeah that's it that's it that's what we need <laughs> and i was thinking it's taken six days to get here but you know it was just that that working together listening understanding sharing that suddenly there was this light bulb moment from my point of view and uh, unfortunately, when I shared it, it was the same light bulb moment from their point of view as well. Brilliant. So, and, and, and all of that coming from your initial idea to, um, to, to just help businesses locally, you know, like in, in, the, in, in the north. So yeah, it's, well, it's amazing I mean, what you, you've achieved over the years, really, when you kind of look at things like that and, and how far your, your reach is. It um, yeah, must make you kind of proud on, 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 on what you've achieved. Oh, yeah. I never, ever imagined for any moment that, you know, sitting in Darlington, you know, whatever, all those years ago, I would end up, um, you know, doing what I'm doing and, and literally going to the places and visiting the places and working with the people that I've worked with. And it's been it's been amazing. It's been a pleasure. It's been a delight, you know, to, to do it. And, and really, realistically, it's it's all been down to the Internet, because obviously, as soon as the Internet really took off, you know, yeah. we started to get inquiries from not only all over the country, but all over the world. And I think I may have mentioned to you one of the projects that we worked on. Um, it was with an organ company in Saudi Arabia. And as part of the, you know, the, the getting to know each other process, I ended up sitting in a Bedouin tent in the city of London, having a meeting with their CEO. And again, it was literally in the city and it was... Uh, a building that there'd been a church and it had been bombed 
um, and they'd, they'd recreated it as a, a centre of peace and reconciliation. And behind it, there, there certainly was a Bedouin tent. So I had a, a meeting with this chief executive officer from um, Saudi Arabia in a Bedouin tent in London, which again was another different day that <laughs> I hadn't really expected when I set off that morning. Fantastic. Sounds really interesting. And um, I'm, 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 get, I'm sure you've got loads more stories along those lines, but I know we've only got a couple of minutes left now. So I'm, I'm going to go to the, the last question. And that's um, just in terms of um, anybody who's looking to buy a franchise business, what one piece of advice would you give to them? Um. At the end of it, you know, it, you, you do your research, you go through your due diligence, you ask lots of questions. Um, at the end of it, I always say, do what, do what feels right and do what your gut instincts, you know, tell you is the right thing to do. I, I believe very passionately that my, you know, my stomach is a good uh, guide to things that I should do and shouldn't do basically we all know if you're not if you're doing something as a child that you shouldn't do you feel your stomach feels queasy basically so you know don't rush it absolutely do not rush it and if anyone tries to to rush you into making a decision just pull back that that's enough to to not do it basically so don't rush it don't let yourself be rushed don't make decisions, you know, rapidly, take time, think it through, evaluate it. You will never be 100% certain. So, you know, I can, I can give anyone assurance that out of all of the franchisees that I've worked with and supported and set up in business, you know, day one, morning one, Monday, they were all white as a sheet <laughs> and literally so nervous about the decision that they'd made. They'd all had sleepless nights, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you will never be 100% certain. But if it feels right in terms of after all of the, you know, the due diligence and the information, if it feels right, you know, seriously think that maybe that's the right thing for you to do. And if it doesn't feel right, absolutely don't do it. If the chemistry is not right, if the relationship's not right, you know, say if you feel that you're being pushed too quickly, don't do it. Fantastic. Julie, thank you so much for your advice, your stories, and for, for sharing your, your, your career with us. Um, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And you too, Ed. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.